Hey guys, it's Mindy Linscomb here, the host of the Something New Show, where we like to learn how to live a life worth celebrating. And I have a very special guest here today, someone who's in an industry that is so impressive, so incredible, and not very normal to meet someone in this kind of industry. But today we have Renee, and I am not going to even attempt your last name, Renee. I'd like you to say your first and last name so the guests can hear it correctly. Yes, it's Renee Bangalstore. Renee Bangelsdorf. I can say that. Okay, yeah. great. Renee is the founder and CEO of the Aviation Collective, a consulting company focused on leadership development and workplace culture improvements. She was recently selected from hundreds of candidates as a board member for the Federal Aviation Administration, so the FAA Women in Aviation and Advisory Board, which I can't wait to get back to that, and an FAA and Congressional Facing Body. That's where she's um, serving. And then most recently, Renee was the founder of Charlie Bravo Aviation, and that was brokering $1 billion in global aircraft sales. She is deeply involved in the aviation industry and public service. She has re been recognized for her work rapidly mobilizing resources and private pub and public partnerships in response to crisis and disasters, including the Hurricane Katrina and um, Hurricane Harvey and earthquakes in Haiti with the Sky Hope Disaster Relief Network. Today, she is a top 30 broker in North America for all sorts of private plane purchases, I'm guessing. And then recently, as kind of a later goal to check off the box, she also became a pilot herself. So, wow, Renee, that's quite a list of accomplishments and just amazing, like, specialty. Really, how did you get into FAA work? Well, first I got into aviation, and that was at the invitation of my husband. About 20 years ago, he started working for a company, buying and selling private jets. And their marketing was awful. And I was a marketer. And so I came in, I helped them fix their website. They had acquisitions spelled incorrectly at the top of their website. I mean, no it was, way. It was there. And then about five years into that, we decided to start our own company. And then the journey of me becoming the CEO of that company, where I served for 13 years, and then the journey out of that company um, was very interesting for me. But I served as the CEO of one of the top brokerages in the country and probably in the world for about 13 years and 99% male dominated industry. So it's been a journey. Wow. And I do want to hear about that. I mean, being a female and I'm assuming, I don't even know what years those were. What years was that, that you were trying to, you know, break that ceiling? What years was that? 2009 to 21. And you just consistently performed and got earned your own respect. But I mean, tell me about that. What was that like? Well, Earning your own respect in an industry like this is a little bit like mountain climbing, right? You, every once in a while, you hit a plateau and you turn and you look at the view, but it is a lot of hard work. And there are a lot of days where you're like, I don't know if I can make it. And so leaning into that, persevering, putting yourself in a position where you really can't quit, um, but you have to keep going is what got me through. There's a lot of tenacity to celebrate. In this. Yeah, I was going to say, you seem like a very tough person. Like you, you really could force, um, you know, just any sort of maybe predisposition of who you might be or capable of doing in a boardroom of men. I could see you just rocking that setting and just saying, hey, actually, I have some really great content to bring to your, you know, your conversation. Well, and to be honest, Mindy, that's learned, right? And it's, it's grown in me. I wasn't born like that. I didn't grow up like that. I was shy. I wanted to be behind the camera, not in front of the camera. I got a journalism degree so I could talk about other people's stories and then allowed God to create mine and just persevered through some tough things um, and was able to feel like I was giving back, um, was able to press through some pretty big failures and that's what's enabled me to have that tenacity in the boardroom. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had that. Uh, were those challenges and trials, were they more personal or professional? Oh, gosh, both. both. Sim simultaneously taking place? Or was it almost like you'd get over one hurdle professionally and then you'd have a personal? And then, or was it all, you know, two lanes happening at the same time? Both. I mean, sometimes there were professional challenges, but not personal challenges. And sometimes there were both. 
sometimes there were personal challenges and, and work seemed to be going okay. But I was in business for all of those years with my husband and that has its own unique challenges um, and own unique benefits. I mean, you know that and other yeah. friends of ours know that. And yeah. so, you know, there are always there are always things that are in our lives that don't seem easy, but those are the things that create character. Yeah, absolutely. And t tell me, um, when you're doing this this business, it seems like you got asked to do some other pretty heavy weightlifting here in this industry besides just being the CEO of your brokerage company. How did those opportunities come about? Well, you know, it's interesting because this is a thing, and. I I'm going to be on my soapbox about being a woman in a male dominated industry. I that's love just it. I, I love am. it. I'm with you, girl. I, I mean, I understand. So a little bit of it is saying, hey, I'm willing to do that. Hey, could I get involved in that? Hey, how can I help? Um, how could I make it easier for the women who are coming behind me, specifically my daughter who's in aviation? How can I make it easier for the women who are coming behind me or the people I see in my world? to thrive. And it's about saying, I'd love to help. That is what was able to take me to the next level in that. And so, you know, a lot of those things I volunteered for. And then as I grew, got selected for bigger and bigger roles. And so it's about volunteering. It's about being willing to do hard things for no pay and sometimes no thanks. And then moving into a leadership role and those kinds of opportunities. Because you, you had the history of um, showing up, the history of doing a job with excellence and saying, oh, she's trustworthy with the little, now we'll give her more. Right. And what was, um, do you remember one of those opportunities being like, oh, this one's a big one and I'm, I'm nervous about this one, but I'm gonna sign up for it. Do you remember any of those? Yeah, and it's funny because people always ask me about imposter syndrome, so I want to talk a little okay, bit about that. Okay, tell me about that. So I was invited to serve on a board, and it was called the International Aviation Women's Association. And I was like, oh, this is kind of a big deal. Like, I wasn't even sure that I qualified for membership, and but I got accepted as a member. And then <coughs> I got accepted as a, as a, got invited to be a board member. And I remember walking in, and it was like, the VP of safety for air operations for FedEx and general counsel for United Airlines. And I'm like, who am I and why am I in this room? And they were like, we want you to be here because you bring a business owner's perspective and you bring a general aviation perspective and you bring a completely different perspective than what we have. And I was like, oh, oh. I'm here because I'm different, not because you're supposed I to be fit. the same. Yeah. Right. And so that was a big eye opening moment for me. And then it was just exciting to be able to sit and learn from those women and also add to their lives. And I think that there are always opportunities for us to do things like that. But that was one of those moments that I was like, oh, wow. So what would you say to someone listening that's maybe dealing with a little bit of imposter syndrome? Maybe they're starting to have some of those doors open up. They're starting to get some really neat opportunities available to them, but they're like, am I even qualified for this? Should I say yes? You know, one of the things that I would say is take the risk. Like the worst that can happen is failure. And speaking from someone who's failed, uh, failure's not that bad. You always learn something from it. You can always pick yourself back up. But the second thing I would say is, if you really know who you are, like you get clear on who you are and what your strengths are and what you believe in, then when you show up in that place, you know what you uniquely bring to the table and that becomes really powerful. That's why they asked you to be there. And so that's incredibly important to do that work, to know who you are and what you stand for and what you bring to the table. It's different, not the same is really valuable to how you show up in the room, whether you feel like you belong in that room or not. Mm -hmm. And I think just the fact that the opportunity is in front of you is such a unique situation that that, that will come and go. 
And so if we don't say yes to it, it's kind of like, oh, I missed that opportunity. And I just don't want to live in a place where God opens a door for me to share or to encourage someone or be on that board that if it feels like it's matching my personal mission and vision of what I bring to the world, I'm like, I want to say yes to that. That was a really divine opportunity. So Yeah. I, I remember interviewing someone one time and she had been the secretary of the U.S. Air Force. So she was a really big deal, just an amazing woman. Her name was Barbara Barrett. And Barbara said, I never join a board where I don't bring something unique to the board. And that mindset shift was really powerful for me. Like, what is it that I bring that no one else on the board has? And what is it that I bring that no one else that they could ask has? So are there a unique set of skills or experiences that make what I offer different? She said, if I don't bring something different, I say no to the board. And I was like, oh, that's, that's so something like, very different. If there's eight of me already there, why do they need me? Right. Yes. And she says no to those. She also says no to things that where she's going to be, um, I don't know, working with her shoelaces tied together, if you will. So where she feels like she's just a token like, oh, this is a woman that could be on our board to check that box. Um, but she wouldn't be set up for success. She says no to those too. And I'm like, oh, that's brave. I'm going to yeah. do that. Yeah. Because you can get a sense right away if it's just to fill like the criteria, you know, the mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. people that make us look represented mm -hmm. as a board or as an organization. And I, I still, to this day, even as I hire people, I'm like, I don't want to ever be that person that checks the box. I want to be the best candidate for the need that we have as a company is who gets the job. Right. And so, you know, that has looked totally different over the different years and co configurations of our team. But I mean, when you really do say, Hey, who's the best person for this job in the need that we have, it's like, that's who you fill it with. Yeah. And it's funny because we looked at a lot of that when I was on that FAA board, Tell like, me about that. how do we get more women in aviation? And it's not about like, Oh, well, let's just hire more women because um, you're putting your family on that airplane. I don't want to hire a female pilot just to check that box, right? It's your family's safety at stake. So we have to go a lot more upstream. How do we get people in the pipeline, in the talent pipeline, even considering aviation? So going way upstream for that, how do we begin to attract younger women into aviation? And then as employers, we need to look at how do I make sure that I'm interviewing all of the candidates that are possible for this, not just looking for the types of workers that I already have? And so we did a lot of work in that, how to shape your workplace culture. I know, so I hear about that. So you're attracting the right candidates to apply for the jobs. What and are some of your recommendations or learnings from that, the culture part? Yeah, so a lot of things. So one is really addressing the biases. So... Am I just hanging out with the people at work that look just like me? Or am I going out of my way to think about, wait, what could I learn from that person who has a different experience? So for me, it might be, are they a different color than me? Or are they different gender than me? Or are they a different age than me that I can learn something from? Did they have military background where I have business background, like where is that crossover? What can I learn from that? So that's one thing to look for as a, as a leader in a company, as an employee, we can be looking for the same things. We can hear other people's stories and see what we have to learn from them. Like staying a little bit more open-minded and making sure that we're including other people's opinions, listening to respectfully to those. But really the heart of corporate culture comes from the very top. I'm working with one of the oldest companies in private aviation right now for some workplace culture, and their CEO is amazing at figuring out how he's going to work with his employees and pull the best out in them. So they already have a good corporate culture. He's just bringing me in to improve 2 or 3 or 5% to drive their revenues and their employee engagement and therefore their customer satisfaction, that incremental, meant, incremental bit higher, mm -hmm. right? And so it's when you have good leadership and someone who's a leader 
who's driving that, that you really experience great results. If the leader's just in it for the money or the fame, you're not going to get that. Mm. So good. So good. Well, you, and you have me thinking about that upstream, you know, concept you said a minute ago where you said, okay, a lot of times it just makes me think about how we can solve a problem um, at face value, at least presumably, but really when you go to the root of it and in your um, serving was trying to figure out why do we not have more women maybe applying or, or seeking out that career path of aviation is not just saying, oh, we need to hire more to check a box. How many times do we as leaders just check a box or finish um, you know, a problem within our organization just by saying, oh, well, we'll just fix it by doing this instead of going upstream and saying, actually, what's the real root of this problem? Whether it's we don't have the traffic that we were hoping um, or the the amount of clients coming through our doors that we want. Or, I mean, you could think of any problem, right? Like our margins are lacking or whatever it might be. But I just think, you know, what foresight you really had there to say, okay, let's go upstream and say, where are these women? And I'm curious, like, how did you change that? What did you, how did you find more women to even consider aviation? Well, there are a number of ways that we do that. PBS actually, as a result of the board, PBS and the National Aviation Hall of Fame partnered to create some elementary school um, curriculum to be able to help elementary school kids, especially in Title I schools, learn about aviation careers. Um, There are a number of organizations that do things to help with this, um, to educate kids but none of them are talking to each other. So they can't, they aren't collaborating and exponentially growing what their efforts, they're just doing them in a silo. So we're working with the FAA and with Congress to combine some of those efforts and give some of those a little bit more um, of federal grant money that's already been allocated, like getting it to the right places to, to push these careers. It's about Um, people going in and talking to kids about this. It's about facilitating um, vocational training at the high school level to educate aircraft mechanics so that they can come straight out of high school, take their test, and start working on airplanes right away. What a gift, too, because that's a much better job than they can get without a college degree, just, oh, I'm going to go get a job in a retail store or something like that. I mean, what a great opportunity for them. Right. After a few years, aircraft mechanics are making $100,000 a year. I mean, it's a great career, and you get to be around some really exciting things, whether you're working on private jets, which is my world, or you're working for an airline. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. What do you feel like? I mean, you do so many exciting things. What do you think is the most exciting thing you do, Renee? The most exciting thing I do is the, the workplace culture work. And the reason for that is that I get to influence the trajectory of the industry going forward. That's really important to me because I think I mentioned this. My daughter is in aviation. She's a pilot and she's a professional pilot. She flies jets. But then she also does training for people who are learning how to fly. And so making the industry better and more inviting for her is is really great for me. I feel like I'm setting her up for success. Wow. My son's also in the aviation industry. He does aircraft leasing. And so both of them, I just want to leave it a better place. And not just for my kids, but for everyone else's kids who want to be in the industry as well. And I mean, the planes aren't going anywhere. Uh, People still love them. There's so much exciting technology on the horizon. Yeah, tell us. Electric vertical and takeoff, like basically electric helicopters. Um, There are uh, hydrogen aircraft being developed right now. There's already some autonomous flight happening with package deliveries. So specifically in Bentonville, Arkansas, one of my friend's companies is delivering packages from Walmart to the surrounding areas. And you'll get a kick out of this. The number one thing that's ordered from Walmart and delivered by these little drones coming in is hamburger helper. When's the last no time you had hamburger way. helper? I'm like, of all the things, I was thinking their pharmacy, like their their medications <laughs> that they have need every week. I was thinking an elderly that don't want to get out in their car. Right. I was thinking pharmacy. Hamburger helper? Exactly. That's crazy. But this company actually did all of their tests for their technology of these, you know, unmanned aircraft delivering this stuff. They did it in Rwanda 
delivering medical supplies and blood to the outlying like to the villages. outlying um, areas for their clinics because otherwise people would be dying. So they've millions well, and of and hours. And it takes so much longer to drive places right. when the road infrastructure isn't there. Right. Wow. So That's it's amazing. There's so many applications for aviation that we don't even think about. You know, if you if you were to have, um, you know, one of our friends just had a kidney transplant, right? What yeah. if that kidney had to come here from Seattle? And it, stay, you know, right? in a certain temperature it and all that. It flies with a doctor from Seattle all the way here. Um, so it's, it's interesting to hear about all these different things, like all the firefighting applications. You know, that's near and dear to, to y'all's heart here in Colorado. Oh, yeah, we deal with a lot of wildfires. It's a big deal. Okay, I have a question since you're in the private jet sector as well. I mean, I think for the average listener, they think that private flying is so unattainable, right? It just seems like, oh, it's only for a certain, you know, echelon or whatever. But I feel like in our conversations together, you've just made it feel so much more accessible than it actually um, ever has been to me. And I think it's just because I never, it's like when you don't know what you don't know, what you don't know. Right. right. And so, I mean, we're talking about the something new show. So I want you to teach our listeners something new and teach them because, you know, they would probably never know what to learn about private airplane rental. Like, what does that even look like? Where does one begin to even see if this is a viable option for them? So I want to start with something that's a little bit younger, um, with that, because there is an organization um, it's part of the EAA, and it's called the Young Eagles um, Program, where people will take, pilots will take young people up for a discovery flight for free. So I need to mention that because absolutely, kids can go experience aviation. And then you can go to just about any airport in the United States where they have a flight school, and there are thousands and thousands of these small airports, and you can take a discovery flight for 100 or $200 and go up in a small airplane like you did as you were growing up yes, with your dad as a pilot. Yes, it's such a cool connection that we and have. And you, you can experience that. So you can experience aviation at that level. But then I'm also, and I didn't even put this on my bio. Well, Renee, <laughs> tell me. Tell me you also. I'm working with a tech company um, called ETH Jets, and we're working on an app to give people access to something called empty legs. So when a private jet gets chartered, um, it's not necessarily starting out in the city where it's picking you up. So if you had chartered a private jet, you would be, and it had to come down from Denver, there would be an empty leg or repositioning leg where they're positioning the leg from Denver to Colorado Springs to pick you up. And so our app identifies those through a proprietary software system that all of these operators use. We built a web hook into that and pull those empty legs out, apply pricing logic to them, and push them out to consumers like you or any of your listeners to be able to have the option to buy that flight on that plane. So it's a little bit, it's kind a of like little a bit win of a hybrid. Win, though. It's I'm, a win-win. I'm like, Absolutely. What a smart, I mean, if you thought of that, I didn't, but you're even helping like that is so brilliant because I am always looking for ways in business to say, okay, where's our slack or our waste? Where's that happening? Sorry, there's a little click in the earphones here, but I was to say, where's the slack? Where's the waste? And with that waste or slack, how can we monetize that? better than what we're doing now because there's so much opportunity sometimes in the waste or slack. And so someone thought of yes. the slack and it's like, Hey, why don't we let people hop in these planes that we're having to relocate anyways, you have the fuel burn right? and the pilot. Right. So it's kind of like, well, let's, let's monetize those flights. Right. And then the other piece of it is people have been trying to monetize those flights for a long time, but there's always been friction in connecting those flights to the clients. So not only are we using something that already exists and can be a profit center for the operator and a benefit to you and your family, but we're also reducing the friction by creating the app. So, so it's it like when you sign up, way. yeah, when you sign up for this as a, as a provider, you already know that your pricing is going to be adapted to maybe what you're comfortable with or whatever. So, um, so it's a win-win. 
It's, it's a win-win. Win. What's the name of this? It's called ETH Jets, E-T-H-J-E-T-S. So the founder of the company um, is an airline pilot. So he's always been around aviation, but had never been on the private jet side. And he started it out with some blockchain ties. And then, and it's really neat how that works, but then brought me in to bring the aviation expertise and the relationships and the connections that I have in the industry. So um, I'm serving on the board there and I'm really excited about what's to come with that company. That's a game changer. And I mean, it's, it's good competition for the airlines as well, because don't you feel sometimes that it's just an interesting niche, uh, you know, where there's like pricing, I don't know, for the airline industry, it's like you have very, in a way you have, yes, you have brands, you have different like options, but you don't have a lot of options, you know, when it comes to differentiation in the marketplace, where in a capitalism culture, I'm just like, in almost everything, there's way more competition, but there's just a few big guys in the airlines and it's like, okay, I got to get to this hub and that's pretty much my option, you know? Um, so, I mean, this is, this is very exciting to differentiate methodology on the, how I can maybe get from point A to B in a more comfortable, um, way. And it might not necessarily even be a cost difference if I'm on a, a jet saving like leg. Right, right. And we're still adding operators. So I'm going to tell you some pricing that we have that's not in this area. And then when the app comes out, anyone can go on and look at our empty legs and see where they are. But we have an operator that we work with that's based in Las Vegas. And we have empty legs almost every day between Las Vegas and LA for $3,000 and you get the whole plane. So it's an experience that you could take your family on getting from Vegas to LA or LA to Vegas um, on a private jet. Well, and can Super I fun. say, when you have a big family like mine, I'm already paying $3,000 for airline tickets. I have four kids. So when we go anywhere, we're at least paying $3,000 for airline tickets. Right. And imagine if you were going with two other couples, like then it's $1,000 a piece. It's yes, so easy. That's so smart. And then we have an operator that's based in Tulsa and does lots of Tulsa to Dallas and and I think even uh, my founder may have mentioned the other night, they had a, a Tulsa to Orlando flight that was $2,400. And how, how will we find out about this? All through the app. All through the app. Unless they can reach out to Renee specifically. <laughs> Which, I'll still point you to the I app. I know, I know, I know. But for now, I mean, where would someone find out about this now before the app? Um, we, actually, if you go to the website, if you go to ethjets.com, um, you can find out more about it. And then if you join our Discord server, you know, that's the social media that is yeah. for younger people. And, yes. And, you know, attached to Twitter and all that kind of stuff. You can actually see all the empty legs that we have right now. We put them in our Twitter feed and we put them in our Discord. Wow. Okay. And then you can reach out, DM us. And, uh, and one of the people on my team will, will get you booked on one of those flights if you want to fly on one. And what's, your, what's the handle, the Instagram handle? It's at ethjets. Girl, you have your hands in so many things. It's an adventure. It is an adventure. I know. And, and the pilot, I mean, she told me she did her pilot's license in four weeks. She shut out the rest of her life, closed her doors, and was like, I'm going to be a pilot in four weeks. Who does that? Not Renee, very many people. <laughs> you, are, you are just inspiring. You really oh, are. Thank you. And I know your daughter probably very much looks up to you and says, thank you, mom, for paving the way. I think she does a little bit, but she got her pilot's license before me. So I also look up to and admire her for doing that. And she did it, you know, I set myself up for success seeing where she struggled in that, right? And so I set myself up with, I had a dedicated plane. I had a dedicated instructor. I did my training in California where it's not cloudy very often. So I set myself up in ways that I knew that I could succeed in the shortest amount of time. Wow. And where, where do you live now? Do you live in California? I live in Fort Worth, Texas. Oh, Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Right by DFW. Right by DFW. I have a little plane. I fly out of Fort Worth, um, go on adventures with my daughter. I love that. And where does she live? She lives in Dallas. Okay. That's great. And so if people wanted to follow you personally, do you have a, you have an Instagram handle or do they just go to the, I have Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Tell all the me things. your personal Instagram at Renee Bangelsdorf. It's just my name um, straight. I, that's the unique thing about having a unique name is, is that it's available. Yeah, it's available. And 
you know, when you Google me, you're, you're going to find me because there's nobody else with my name. What, um, what is that dissension from like that? Is it? It's German. German. I yeah. was like, tell me that I'm, German. I'm almost a hundred percent German too. Wow. Yeah. My mom's mom's. Ma- so my grandmother's maiden name was Bonenkamp. So yeah. Very On my German. dad's side, we had Minor and Reimer and Reichert. So all, wow. the, all the German names. Yes. Well, what would you say as we wrap up today, what would you say to someone that's like, I want to be a pilot? What would be something you'd encourage them? Like if they just even had that crazy idea, like, oh, I possibly want to be a pilot one day. What would you tell them? First thing to do is reach out to that Young Eagles program. And you can do a Google search on that and For find the, the local chapters and then go fly. And, and see if you actually like it. Um, and then if you're a woman, reach out to Women in Aviation International. Um, they have a Girls in Aviation Day. You can get involved in that. Um, they have a Girls in Aviation app. They just got a grant for that. And, um, and then just get plugged in. Figure out where your local airport is and just go ask questions. There are always old timers sitting around, you know, wanting to talk about airplanes and flying. My dad is one of them. I know. He's always out at the airport here, and he's got his hangar and just, you know, tinking around on his plane before he takes it out. And they do. They just love talking about it. And it's so crazy how much they would volunteer. I mean, just like yourself, but just volunteer their time to help other people get exposed to something that they love. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's really neat. One of my friends has a program where she takes retired aviators, retired military aviators, and has them teaching and mentoring high school students. It's in Louisville, Kentucky. And the the beauty of her program is that not only are the young people learning about aviation, but they're learning about um, an older generation, like their grandparents' generation. And they're learning some of the intangible things that we can learn from our grandparents about character and what being an American stands for and, and all of that. And it infuses so much life into those old timers, which I'm like practically an old timer myself now. So I'm saying that with the most love, but it infuses so much life into them yes. to be able to share about their country and their lives and their history and what they've learned in their careers and their, their aviating skills. Oh, it's mutually beneficial. Exactly. Yeah. So having that community and being able to incorporate different generations is really powerful. So I would highly encourage young people to do that and old people to be open to that. Sorry. Um, uh, seasoned people to be open seasoned. To yeah. Let's say seasoned. We <laughs> don't want to offend. No, totally. I love that. Well, this has been special. Okay. We always like to wrap up the show with my guest's favorite drinks. Cause we're going to cheers. So what did you, um, what did you do for our drink today, Renee? Okay. So, Our drink is one that I love, mostly in the summer, but I drink it in the winter too. And it is sparkling water with a little splash of grapefruit juice. Okay. I used to drink it with simple syrup, but, you know, I'm trying to watch my sugar. I'm proud of you. I'm really proud. You know, in our group that we're in, we're in a real health conscious group thinking about being the best versions of ourselves. And I'm so proud of you for thinking about that. So thanks for being on the show today. Cheers. Cheers. I love it. And I'm so glad that we get to hear a little bit more about um, just, I mean, how business and aviation and mentorship and workplace culture, I mean, all of that can go together. And hopefully we've inspired some of our listeners to say, hey, no matter what your gift might be or your interest may be, that some people may think of a, as a hobby. Actually, there's there's work to be done within that um, community. So I'm, I'm excited to read more. I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to know you better too this year. So I want to thank Renee for being on our show. And I want to say, if you enjoy the show today, that we're going to ask you to subscribe, leave a comment, uh, maybe start to follow Renee, follow the Something New Show, because we'd love for you to join our community on learning how to live a life worth celebrating. One more time. Cheers. Cheers. Thank and you, Renee. You know what, Mindy? What? I almost showed up here in one of your wedding dresses. You this did? This store is so <laughs> beautiful. I was like looking around. I'm like, oh, I could put is it okay if I show up on the podcast in costume? And you just sit in a wedding dress right here? That would be so fun. It actually would be really fun. And for the people watching YouTube, they'd be like, wow, they're getting like all into this. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love it. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much for yeah. inviting me to be here. Of course. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the show, rate, review, and share with a friend. Also, follow The Something New Show on Instagram and Facebook. If you want a fuller experience, watch the show on YouTube to help you create a life worth celebrating.